Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people, Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from you before. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of the Lord. Hello again. What we've been doing with these sermons, although there was a a break uh, last week uh, as Jagar uh, was here. We have been looking at this concept in the Bible of covenant. Covenant. And what I have suggested to you is that the entire Bible can be structured uh, with this concept of covenant. Covenant is God entering into a relationship. Speaking to those whom he has created. Exercising authority and advancing a plan. Making promises while also uh, making threats. But it is God working forward in relationship. And what we're doing is we're, we're connecting various covenants in the Bible. And this morning we'll be talking about King David. And of course we'll be talking about King David as the recipient of God's covenant. First of all, would you join me in prayer before we look at this passage more closely. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we do thank you that you speak to us. You have initiated this relationship, and by your revealed word, we know you. And so we thank you for making yourself known. Be present with us by your spirit, that we might have understanding. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when we look at these arrangements uh, between uh, God and his people, uh, we can recap them very easily. So in this regard, the covenants kind of form a little bit of a table of contents for the Bible, almost like memorizing that table of contents. We know that God uh, entered into a covenant with uh, Adam and Eve, and then God entered into a covenant with uh, Abraham and his family, and then Noah and the world, and then Moses uh, and a nation. And in each of those instances, uh, we, we hear God promising to do something and the people promising uh, to do something. This is very clear, isn't it, with Adam and Eve? With Adam and Eve, God uh, promises that Adam and Eve will taste death if they uh, eat the tree of, or the fruit of this tree. That's a very stark covenant. Uh, it's sometimes called a covenant of works. It's sometimes also called a covenant of life. If you don't eat from that tree... You'll have life. But that, that same kind of dance or arrangement, um, it, it trickles through uh, biblical history. And with all of these other covenants after Adam and Eve, starting with uh, Abraham and Noah, the response of the people is not to work or to do or even to avoid doing. The response of the people is to believe. Trust. Trust. 
And what we see in these covenants that theologians uh, group together as the the covenant of grace, what we see in these covenants is really a precursor to uh, the, the sharing of the gospel with our friends and our colleagues and our neighbors. What are we asking our neighbors to do? Are we asking them to perform a kind of labor or work? For instance, be a better neighbor to me, be a better colleague to me. We may want those things, but that's not what we're doing when we're offering the gospel. We're offering a message that is a message uh, that only needs to be received in trust for all of the benefits to roll forth. That's the preaching of the gospel, telling others about Jesus, making a promise, but there's nothing that needs to be done in return for the benefits of that promise. And there's a disconnect there, of course. I'm offering a promise, but I'm not the one actually making the promise, am I? No. God is making a promise. And just as it was with Abraham, Noah, Moses, King David, you simply must trust and the promises roll forth. This morning we're going to look at King David, and uh, we're not going to talk about uh, the character of King David. So often when we talk about King David, we talk about all the wonderful things that King David did, and you go do those things as well. You know, it seems like all of King David's life is wrapped up in 1 Samuel 13, uh, that he was a man after God's own heart. And so you should be a man or a woman after God's own heart, and you should. However... We're not going to do that this morning as we look at King David. We're going to look at King David in the same way that we did with Noah and with Abraham and with Moses as a recipient of a covenant promise that God makes. And what we're going to find in this passage is this. Let me, t- let me tell you where we're going before we get there. David is a king who exists to display another king. David is a king who exists to display another king. One uh, commentator says this, he says that the peace and stability under David's kingdom, all of that peace and stability, it points forward to the saving reign of his descendant, Jesus the Messiah. This is Rick Phillips. He says that all the peace and stability under King David's reign, it all points to a descendant of King David, the Messiah. I want to begin by looking at two things that seem pretty obvious. We just take them in order. The first is that David makes plans, but the second is that God makes plans as well. David makes plans, God makes plans. The very last point of the sermon is going to be, okay, so what's God doing? But, but look at the obvious. Uh, David is someone who makes plans. Now, uh, you didn't hear the first verse of uh, 2 Samuel 7. But that verse says this, The king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all of his surrounding enemies. Okay, so King David. The passage that Karen read earlier is set in this. King David is living in his house and God has given him rest from all of his enemies. That's very good news for a king, isn't it? It's almost like uh, David has reached a point in his life where he can just sit back and rest. God has done everything necessary. In many ways, it sounds like uh, the kind of life many of us anticipate in retirement. Sitting back and relaxing, right? Uh, No debt, no loan officers uh, after me, no bosses after me. I have found rest. And, And, you know, there's a beach and a cabana and other things as well. But... This is where David is. David is at rest in his house, and no enemies are a problem to him. Just think about what David's life has been like up to this point. He's had to fight with Saul, the previous king. He's had to relocate his capital. Remember, David was a king in Hebron for seven years before he was able to relocate his capital to Jerusalem. And even then, uh, he had to defeat uh, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And David has children, six children at least, we're told at this point, six wives as well. David doesn't have any enemies. David has a house. And the Ark of the Tabernacle, it's in the city. And everything seems to be balanced. And if you want to know what kind of of man David is, uh, David is a man who wants to do something. It's very interesting that David, he doesn't simply retire. What does David want to do? David wants to build a house for the Lord. 
It seems as though from verse 2 of 2 Samuel 7 that that David is uh, looking out uh, over the city of Jerusalem and he sees these buildings that he has constructed, um, enabled with the cedars of Lebanon from the north. And it's probably beautiful. And there's a tent. And David's thinking, we need to fix the tent issue. David is not just retiring in his peace. David is, he's got a plan. And, And the plan is actually pretty good. He, he sees that there is a tent and he knows something about the character of God. And the character of God is that he is a God who is big. He is worthy of reverence. He is worthy of worship. We need to do something about the tent. Just that alone, David's desire to replace the tent with a building, that alone tells us what David thinks about the character of God. This is a positive thing. David wants there to be a larger house for God. David is looking at his own house and he's thinking, why should my house be better than God's house? And he wants a bigger, better house for God. This is a good thing. David, he's not retiring. And and David, he has this, this view of God's character that we can see. But David also has a view of God's word. And here's what maybe didn't stand out. The passage that we looked at this morning is a passage that has come from the lips of Nathan. So at the beginning of 2 Samuel 7, uh, David, he is talking to Nathan. He's actually sharing this plan with Nathan. And then Nathan says, you know, that's great, go for it. But then he, 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 t- he sleeps on it, and God speaks to him in his sleep. And Nathan says these words to David. David doesn't retire. David respects the character of God, but David also respects the word of God. A prophet is saying this to David. And as you'll see, the prophet corrects the way David is thinking. David is making plans in his supposed retirement. And they're actually good plans. Honors the character of God, listens to the word of God. But here's the second point. God makes plans as well. And, and, and God's plans actually uh, frame David's plans. Uh, David is busily making plans, and God's plans frame his plans. And in fact, God's plans frame David as a person. Just, just thinking about this architectural uh, language that we have in this passage. Uh, David is uh, working to build this structure. It's not just a house, it's a city. And, and he wants to build something that's over the tent of God. But he's also building a life, a, an aura, a kingship. You know, David is building something. And, and we can almost hear uh, the cultural mandate that was given to Adam and Eve. That you would exercise a dominion. Uh, that you would work. That you would keep. That you would guard. That you would do these things. Even multiplying. And David is doing those things. But that's not the end all. That's not all there is for David's life. And there's a sense in which uh, we admire people who uh, uh, reach the pinnacle of their industry or of their career. They're amazing athletes or amazing CEOs or uh, amazing artists. And one of the things that, uh, that makes us excited about people like this is that they don't just stop. They keep on going. We listen to that and we go, wow, that's encouraging. They keep on going. I want to be like that. Keep on going. But whatever David does, all of it is framed by God's plans. And and this is what Nathan uh, says to David. Uh, Nathan is saying to David, David, all of your plans are framed by me. You you think that you're in charge, but you're actually not. Nathan reminds David, here's a larger plan. And your grand plan, even at the pinnacle of that plan, it all fits inside the architecture of God's covenant promises. Something bigger. Uh, By the way, um, one of the caricatures of Christianity is that uh, Christianity seems to exist to make life unfun. Uh, We'll hear uh, non-believers say this, and and perhaps some of us said this before we were converted. I don't want to confess that any of us say this now. Let's just leave it at that. But sometimes we think that Christianity exists to, like, suffocate me. To take everything that is joyful and wonderful, take everything that is fun, and actually uh, shrink it down. Here I am, God, minding my own business. I'm multiplying, I'm working, I'm keeping, just like you told that guy and that girl in the Garden of Eden. 
But when we describe Christianity, what we're saying is not that God shows up as the great killjoy to crush all of those things. God reminds us that all of those things function within his larger plan. Your story is indeed a story. And you're living that story. And you're using your thoughts and your actions and emotions in a certain way. You're meant to do that. God has stamped you in such a way that you do those things. But Christianity says... Our story is in another story. And I am never going to express my thoughts or my actions or my loves in a way that is going to give those things that I most want unless I do those things within God's story. I understand something about my story. And David, through the lips of a prophet, Nathan, is is beginning to understand his story And the more he understands about God's story, the more he understands and in fact flourishes in his micro story. Listen uh, how Nathan reminds uh, David that he is in God's story. You see verse 8 in our passage. Uh, Nathan says this to his king. He says, uh, my king... Listen what God says to you. I took you from a pasture full of sheep... Remember, king, despite the throne, despite the house, despite the safe city, Nathan says, yeah, but God is the one who took you from the pasture full of sheep. God says in verse 9 that I have been with you wherever you went, wherever you went, I was there. God says to him, verse 9, I am the one who has cut off all of your enemies. Now, this is humbling. It ought to be humbling, isn't it? But also how liberating it is. It is liberating to be delivered from a sense of pomposity. It is liberating to be gently reminded that your arrogance has no place. It's, it's, It's pain and delight at the same time. Paradoxical for sure. But David is actually being, he's being uh, shrunk down a little bit by Nathan's words. But as he's being shrunk down, he's placed in God's frame so that he might be uh, lifted up and shown what his life is really important for. David knows that God has taken good care of him. He knows that in his kingship. But we actually can look at Psalms that David has written. Psalm 22 is a great example of this. He knows exactly what Nathan is saying. Nathan is not merely saying that your plans fit in God's plan. He knows that Nathan is saying that my very life fits in God's plans. Because he says in Psalm 22 that God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Uh, Psalm 22, Psalm 139, both say that. David knows this. Everything about his life, every thought, every action, every love is framed by God's story. You know, this is why a historic Christianity struggles with so many of the social issues that we're experiencing today. Historic Christianity struggles with the debates about human sexuality because historic Christianity believes that God has made people to live within God's story. That God has made them a certain way and they don't flourish unless they acknowledge that they are made a certain way. And I know these issues are extremely complex, but uh, historic Christianity understands things about human sexuality and about gender debates and about marriage and about abortion because God frames all of these things in such a way that historic Christianity cannot teach otherwise. This is how God made us. And all of us live our lives within his story. And he's going to come again and make all things right. So these social issues are very hard for Christians because we know all of them live within God's story and it makes life in this world hard. God cares about all those things. He has the authority to speak on those things. David knows that his life is framed by God's story. These social issues are framed by God's story. But historic Christianity not just says that all of these these, uh, social issues are framed by God's story. Uh, We have an example in Acts chapter 7 of a preacher who preaches and dies. It's Stephen. Stephen. 
And uh, historic Christianity teaches that social issues fit within God's framework, must fit within God's framework because he is the one who has made us. He's the one who, who, who's made us to think and to act uh, and to love. But when Stephen preaches, he says, this is, this is why we're so hopeful about the church. If Stephen is living in Jerusalem, when Jerusalem on one, on one Sunday uh, swells to some 3,000 new believers... And the church in Jerusalem is growing by leaps and bounds. It still has no political representation. It has no authority before Rome. But there it is, this church in Jerusalem, it's growing. And Stephen, he says, the reason we're so hopeful about the church is because what's happening in this church was started before in the covenants. And you read Acts chapter 7. And you, you, you get to see Stephen who is justifying what's happening in the life of the church. This small, feeble little body that's taking shape in Jerusalem before everyone's eyes. And Stephen answers the question, how in the world did this happen? By going back to Abraham and to Moses and to David. And telling the story of God's covenant work in the world in time and in space. That's how we understand the social issues of the day. That's why we're hopeful about the church. It's God's covenant of grace rolling forward. And David, he's being told this by Nathan. He is a king who exists not to display his own kingship, but to display another king. Because God has framed David's kingship in such a way that that kingship does something else. This is the last point of the sermon. What does it do? What does it do? David makes plans. God makes plans that frame David's plans. But what is it then that God is doing? And, and, and it's interesting that uh, we don't know all of the details about uh, David's desire to build a house. And God saying to David, you don't get to build a house, but King Solomon is going to build a house. And you know, we know that there's something more than just a real estate development question going on here. There's something more. And God doesn't seem to be uh, telling us exactly why it is that David can't build a house. I mean, it could simply be that God doesn't uh, need a house or need a house now. So I don't need a house. Uh, don't worry about it. I never asked for a house. Forget it. Um, it may be because David is a man of war, but not a contractor. Even that's hard to understand. A man of war, I think, could probably build a nice house. Probably be really secure, wouldn't it? But, but David, uh, we read in Scripture, is a man of war, and he doesn't want that man building his house. Um, and it could be that the tent is just a, a great picture of God's presence with his people, that he moves about with his people, and God doesn't want that, that picture to go away just yet. We don't know exactly why David can't build a tent. But here's what God does say to David. That real estate detail, David, I'm not going to share with you, but here's what I am going to share with you. Uh, one commentator named uh, uh, Opalmer Robertson, uh, he calls this very passage, these verses, the climax of the Old Testament. Uh, when it was read to you this morning, did it feel like a climax? Mm, probably not. But this is a climax. Something extraordinary is happening as Nathan is preaching to David, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's so meaningful to David. What David says uh, on his deathbed, his last words, you can look at them in 1 uh, Samuel uh, chapter 23. In David's last words, he says, For God has made with me an everlasting covenant. And that's a word that's in this passage. An everlasting covenant. I'm sorry, not the word covenant, but the word everlasting he has ordered uh, all things and made them secure. God has done this. The king on his deathbed, he is not enacting a big structures that display all of his victories in war. Kings of Babylon, kings of Assyria, kings of Persia, kings of Egypt, they do that. But not David. Don't make an enormous stele that has pictures of my war victories. For God has made with me an everlasting covenant. David would know that for a variety of reasons, but this discussion that Nathan has, do you know that this is the longest speech of God after Moses? From Moses all the way up to 2 Samuel 7, this is the longest speech of God. It wasn't read in its entirety, but that's significant. 
And God calls David something in this passage, verse 4 of our passage. Uh, He calls David, uh, my servant David. God calls no one my servant up until this point except Moses. And I want you to just think about the promises that God makes to King David. There's something about the promises that makes sense and something that doesn't make sense. Like listening to uh, a child who's not fabulous at speaking... Right? So it's not just a matter of, of, a, of a small vocabulary. It's just the words don't always come out exactly right. And you listen to a child like that, and it's like, I, you know, I'm with you like every fourth or fifth word. And you hope that over time you'll be with them every second word. It's easier if it's your child. But when you listen to these promises, it's almost like God speaking in a way that we don't quite understand. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples In verse 9, God says, I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. Of the whole earth. I mean, David is a king and he's a secure king. But this is not the kind of kingdom that's going to grow in size in comparison to, say, Egypt. The whole earth? I'm going to make for you a great name like the great ones of the earth. And in fact, if David has any any recourse at all for understanding what in the world God is speaking about, he'd have to go to Abraham. Because in Genesis chapter 12, that's how God speaks to Abraham. That God is going to make Abraham's name a great name, which is really making his own name a great name. And look at verse 10. I will appoint a place For my people. Is not David hearing these words in the city of Jerusalem? A place for your people. Like we're here. This is the place for your people. But God says I will appoint a place for my people. And he also says there will be no violent men. uh, Rest from all of your enemies. And, and, And David has to hear this and go. You're promising to do something that's like here now. Got a place and And we have rest. But it's a promise of something in the future. And it's like David listening to a little kid speak. And I kind of get what you're saying, but I kind of don't. But if David is going to understand it, he's going to have to, again, go to Abraham. And here he would have to go to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 15. And and there, uh, God speaks to Abraham in such a way where he tells Abraham that I'm going to make you a place, a a place for my people, and I'll be there uh, with you. And and look at verse 12. Again, when, when Nathan says these things, David is nodding his head, but in the back of his head he's thinking, well, wait, wait. He says to David, when you die, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come for your body, and from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. But like Solomon is like there. Like Solomon's born. We're told earlier in 1 Samuel that Solomon is born. So he has children all over the place. And how is it then that there's going to be a future offspring? This is something O. Palmer Robertson reflects upon. David, he seems to have many, if not all, of these things. And yet God is offering to him a covenantal promise. But but things get even a bit stranger than that. In verse 13, when God talks to David, the best way to understand these things is that there must be a greater king down the road. Verse 13 says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. There's the word for everlasting. And verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Three times it's going to be the kind of kingship that lasts forever. Do you see why David would nod while at the same time wonder, Hmm, I'm not sure about this. The promises are too big. The promises are beyond just a succession. They're beyond just a matter of authority. They're beyond just building a nation and keeping that nation. And he keeps going on. He says in verse 14, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. There's an intimacy there that David should ponder. Why am I to anticipate that when 
you're my father and I'm your son, aren't I? God says there's going to be a greater son. And, and what David is, is beginning to, to understand more and more is that his kingship is framed within God's plan and that God's plan is far larger than his kingship. And if he wants to know what to do with his kingship, it is to elevate the king to, wh- to whom his kingship points. And to you, if you want to do something meaningful with your life, use your life to point to the one who made you, to the one who saved you. And you see how that works. David is actually being taught this by Nathan. Over time, he, he, he does, David does understand uh, that the true successor to his kingship is not Solomon, but Jesus. Just, just listen to what David says in Psalm 45. He says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Who's David talking about in Psalm 45 if he's not talking about Jesus? If there are any doubts at all, that expression, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son, the New Testament in Hebrews 1 chapter 5 tells us exactly what David thinks about that that passage. David believes this is a future son. And on this side of the incarnation of Jesus, we understand from Hebrews 1 5 that David is talking about Jesus. That David's kingdom is not special because Solomon is going to build something great. David's kingdom is not special because he has laid groundwork for the authority of Levites and the priestly ministry in Jerusalem. David's kingship is not special because he has protected the city of Jerusalem from earthly enemies. David's kingship is not special because David lived such a holy and righteous life. We're going to learn more about that later, aren't we? No, David's kingship is special. Because it prepares the world to see Jesus. Because David is a king who exists for that purpose. To display another king. David makes plans. Those plans are framed. What is God doing? God is preaching his son. Here's something that we need to to think about as we go into this week. David is a king. David is a man who did amazing things for God, recorded in Holy Scripture. David is the kind of man we can only aspire to, even considering his sins. However, David's life, as great as it was, meant to call out Jesus, to show Jesus. And Christian, I would say to you, those of you who profess faith, what makes you so special that you don't have to do what David did with his life? What makes you so special that you can hive off little portions of your life such that your thoughts and your actions and your loves can have just a tiny bit of real estate that belongs just to you and you alone? All of David's life was framed by the Messiah. So too for all of the lives of those who profess faith in Jesus. This is an encouragement for us. And this is, this is what the covenants do. David is a king who exists to display another king. So too, King's Cross. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you for speaking to us in a way uh, that we understand. We thank you for, uh, even as it's difficult to see, for you stitching together uh, the 66 books of the Bible in such a way that we can uh, see a continuous thread running from beginning to end. You love your Son, and all of your promises are secured in your Son. Thank you, Father, for teaching us about your Son in Holy Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.